Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So as I mentioned um, last night, for those of you that were not here, uh, this is going to be uh, basically part two uh, of three um, opportunities that I take to uh, try to just share some thoughts about the last week. Uh, last evening, uh, if anybody would like to discuss some of the things that I, I, I spoke about, we can talk about it after services. Uh, it was relatively straightforward. Um, I will make allusion to it in some of my remarks today. Part three, which I spoke about last evening, uh, I'm going to, at some point, um, whether it's on a Wednesday afternoon or in an evening, I will conduct a class on uh, weapons in Judaism. Uh, basically going through the halacha, the Jewish law, uh, emanating from the Talmud that discusses uh, really all of the issues that you're seeing being debated and talked about on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and everything in between, whether it's the ownership of weapons, the sale of weapons, who should own a weapon, whether or not self-defense is viable, uh, all of it is discussed in the Talmud, um, and I'll be able to share that with you without venturing into the realm of politics. As for this morning, uh, I, I want to begin by telling you that before I, uh, I, I came to B'nai Aviv, I interviewed uh, really all over the country in order to find a home uh, for, what was it? it was just uh, my wife and my oldest daughter and myself. Um, and we ended up interviewing uh, in an incredible community, which will remain nameless, uh, incredible community with a spectacular, spectacular building and a beautiful sanctuary. And I'm being given a tour of this beautiful sanctuary, and the person who's guiding me decides to tell me, uh, as I compliment how beautiful the ark is, decides to tell me, oh, well, there's actually a very funny story about the ark. Well, what do you mean? She says, well, they actually made a mistake in constructing this building. I said, what do you mean they made a mistake? She goes, it actually faces west. She didn't realize it. But she basically planted a seed that began to just grow and grow and grow. I couldn't get over the fact that I could potentially be davening in a sanctuary for the rest of my life that was facing west. Because which way do Jews face when they daven? Who said it? Towards Jerusalem. We face east. But we face, Jews pray, we face towards the city of Jerusalem. Now, what happens if we happen to be inside of Jerusalem? Which way does one pray if they happen to be inside the holy city? And the answer is, we face the place in Jerusalem where the temple stood. And what if we happen to be near where the temple stood, standing within once was the temple courtyards? What if we're there? Which way do we face? We face the innermost part of the temple, the holiest part of the temple. We would face where the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, once stood, the area in the temple that was so holy, so sacred, that only the high priest would enter it, and would only enter it once a year, on what day? Yom Kippur, in conditions of complete purity. Now, what would the high priest have seen in that space? It's a question that we rarely ask, because the temple's been destroyed for 2,000 years. Authors and filmmakers, they have endeavored to portray the mystery and the majesty of this sacred encounter, but we don't need to refer to Raiders of the Lost Ark in order to find an answer. What the high priest would have seen in the Holy of Holies is preserved for us in the Torah. We read it last week. We read it last week. The very center of the Kodesh Kodeshim was the Aron. The Holy Ark, it contained the two tablets, the Ten Commandments inside of it. And immediately above the Aron was the Kaporet, a golden slab, a cover. And it was adorned with two golden statues. They were mirror images of each other. Two winged beings. What were they called? Cherubim. Kruvim in Hebrew. And the Torah is very specific. Vayu Kruvim. They shall have their wings spread out above, shielding the cover of the ark with their wings. They shall confront each other, their faces being turned toward one another. And it's beneath this canopy, 
beneath this canopy created by the wings of these creatures where God's presence was said to dwell. And the Torah expends verse after verse explaining the materials, the dimensions, the facade, the building logistics of this holy space. But it leaves out one odd detail. What did these angelic winged creatures look like? Not in the Torah. Could they really have been faceless? The Talmud answers the question for us. Rabbi Abayu answers the question for us. My kruv, Amar Rabbi Abayu, ke rivaya, sheken babavel korin leyinoke, rivaya. It's in Aramaic. The word kruv, he says, it really means ke rivaya, like a child. In Babylonia, one refers to a child as a rivaya. Rabbi Abayu is referencing this Masorah, this tradition that we've had since the time of Moses, that the Kruvim did in fact have faces. The faces of children. So when Jews turn and we pray towards the site of the Holy of Holies, we are facing the site of the Ten Commandments, we're facing the place where the presence of God used to dwell, and we are facing a place that was once adorned by the faces of children. Could we expect it to be any other way? Children are our Holy of Holies. Children have always been the Kodesh Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies of the Jewish people. Are not children the ones who are most full of purity, hopefulness, optimism, the potential for making the world more sacred and better? The Holy of Holies was the innermost part of the temple. Even today, right now, rings of Jewish worshipers encircle its site from around the world, turning towards it, placing it at the very center of our communal concern because of how much we treasure and wish to protect the Holy of Holies and what it contained. We treasure the Torah. We seek to protect it. And we treasure children. We seek to protect them. It's been our job since the giving of the Torah. We are failing. Wednesday night, I was at the BB&T Center. I was there for the town hall meeting. I mentioned it yesterday evening. I thanked our representative, Rick Stark, who was able to help me be there. And I sat with many of the families. And I sat behind Alec Schachter, Zichrali Pacha. May his memory be a blessing. I sat behind his best friend one of the three boys who delivered a eulogy at his funeral on Sunday. And I use that term deliberately, boy. He was walked in by his family. And his eyes were just as swollen and just as red as they'd been four days earlier, almost as if he hadn't stopped crying. And I had this notepad with me because I wanted to not write down what people were saying, but write down what I was experiencing, feeling, observing. So I had this notepad with me and as I watched him turn into his row, his father draping his arm around him, I scribbled down a single phrase. He's so little. He's so little. Not short. It wasn't about his size, but he couldn't have been more than 70 pounds. How much do you weigh? You know, how much do you weigh? You don't know? He was smaller than Ari. He was littler than Ari. But that's not what I was commenting on. It was about his face. Had it not been drenched in tears, you'd look at him and you'd still be able to use the word cute. Even though he was 14, you'd use the word cute because he hadn't outgrown it yet. He was a cute little boy, the face of a child, the face that would have been plastered on the Kruvim inside of the Holy of Holies. And so I sat two seats away from Fred Gutenberg, you all saw him on television. His daughter was murdered. He didn't sit down once during the four hours I was there. He did not sit down once. And he made that torn black ribbon on his jacket all the more visible. And his jaw was quivering incessantly. It's like someone about to burst into a sob or someone about to explode into a rage. For four hours, he neither sobbed nor raged. Even during his exchange with Senator Rubio, he was not raging. His jaw continued to quiver. It did not stop. 
as if trying to figure out whether sadness or anger was going to win out eventually. And I think that's where all of us are right now. We are balancing between this unprecedented sadness and this untempered anger. Everyone's jaw quivering, trying to figure out what's going to explode out of us. Tears or rage. And each of us is pointing a finger. We're all trying to identify the cause for why we are where we are. And it gives us a sense of purpose. Identify the cause, fix it, solve the problem. But I sat listening to students and parents and politicians on Wednesday night, and I watched tempers flare as fingers pointed at causes beyond the literal smoking gun. Tempers were flaring. You couldn't see how bad it was on the television. It was scary at times to be in that building. And I didn't blame anybody who was flaring. So I'm a rabbi. I'm not a legislator. I'm a spiritual leader. I'm not a politician. I'm a commentator on the soul, not on the differences between magazine sizes, the definition of a bump stock. The outcry for more sensible gun laws was expected. Obviously, something needs to change, as I mentioned last night, and quickly. But we failed our children by more than not fixing our gun laws. And we shoulder a significant amount of blame. I observed this scene on Wednesday night, and I found myself asking questions beyond the obvious, how can we change gun laws? Because people, the mother of Alyssa Aladef, they were demanding different things. They were demanding things like metal detectors, fortified barriers around schools, bulletproof, reinforced glass on every window. In short, part of the fix was turning schools into fortresses. How did we get here? How do we get here? In a single generation, the security members, the security measures that once inspired mass migration out of a school district, migration out of a school district, because who wants to send their kid to a school with a metal detector? Now those are prerequisites for parents. Now we don't want to send our children to schools unless they have metal detectors. How did we get here? How do we get to the point that when parents interview preschools, it happens here. They ask questions about active shooter drills. How do we get here? There's a related epidemic plaguing our children today. It also didn't exist 25 years ago. Suicide. Suicide existed 25 years ago. Don't get me wrong. But it didn't exist to the point where, like in Broward County, Suicide prevention programs are implemented for 11-year-old children. I didn't know the word suicide when I was 11 years old. What has changed in 25 years that has led young people to even consider the option of killing others or killing themselves? What has changed? Bullying, right? Everybody said bullying has changed. Classmates of mine were bullied. Classmates of yours were bullied. In fact, this mess inspired me to research the boy in my school, growing up, who was the primary target of bullies. He was teased mercilessly. I remember it like it was yesterday. He had significant social issues. He probably would have been placed on the spectrum if he had been born 25 years later, if that spectrum had existed. And kids, they abused him emotionally. They would sing songs about him, songs I still remember. They abused him physically. I remember we were at a bar mitzvah, just like this, a bar mitzvah. A group of boys, they had him in a corner, and they were whipping him with those glow necklaces like he was an animal. I remember it. If you want to know how I reacted to those things, you can ask me after, but I can tell you I was not with the bullies. It didn't get easier for that boy in high school. And so I looked him up on Wednesday. It was actually Thursday morning. I found him on Facebook. It wasn't hard. Happily married, two kids. We all knew children like this. We all knew children like this. We may have been children like this. When did mass murder, when did suicide become a viable option for kids? To not fail our children any longer, we need to not only identify the smoking gun, but what leads to individuals to pick up the gun in the first place. And believe it or not, the former gun control, I think it's the easier the two problems to fix. I really do. It's the easier of the two problems to fix. I got a friend 
He's a hematologist oncologist. And we were sitting once and he noted to me the irony of a blood cancer. The disease utilizes the very vessels that provide us life. Cancer, it circulates itself via the pathways dedicated to our growth, our survival, our well-being. The disease that plagues this country is very much the same. Technology age. It has inspired unprecedented growth for our society. It has simultaneously created unprecedented pathways for evil to circulate and reach impressionable minds. Blood cancers, they go undetected often. It takes a separate system to raise awareness about a larger problem. School shootings, symptom. The fact that there's actually a statistic for suicide for 10 to 14 year old children, symptom making us all aware of a catastrophic disease and we are obligated to wage war against it. Evil exists in the world. You just read it. It is Parashat Zachor. Zachor et asher asalacha Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to you. Attacking the weak, the vulnerable Israelites that fell behind during the march from Egypt to Israel. The Torah reminds us that this war with Amalek, it's eternal. It lasts Forever, in every generation, we're obligated to blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Lo tishkach, do not forget, it says. Our sages all agree. Amalek is not a racial or ethnic designation. It's not a people. The actual Amalekites, they perished during the time of the Bible. But the Torah still commands us in every generation to fight them. Why? Because Amalek, according to us, the Jews, Amalek is the personification of evil. A legacy of hatred and violence that persists even to this day. When we read the commands, Achorot Amalek, we understand Amalek not as a people. It's an idea, not an ethnic group. It is a metaphor for hatred and evil that undermines our common humanity. And it will seep slowly into our midst like a cancer until it consumes us. 25 years. For 25 years, we've slowly allowed Amalek to spread same technology that elevated our society to unprecedented heights has provided the pathways for evil to reach and distort our kids' minds. We have a head of school here. We have a lot of teachers here. We have a lot of people who work with our young people who will tell us generations different. Something has gone askew. There is a toxin that is penetrating all of our children. It's taken school shootings for us to notice that there is a disease. Elie Wiesel said it. You know when he said it? After Sandy Hook. He said something has gone terribly wrong in this country. It is up to politicians to limit access to guns. It's a must. It will be up to clergy, educators, social workers, parents to remember Amalek. Evil exists. It's contaminating our society to the point where what a generation ago was reprehensible to a parent, metal detectors at a school, is now a prerequisite. We are at war with Amalek. We are at war with a cancer that has changed our society and only generation to something which is unrecognizable. I do not recognize. I do not recognize when I look out the window and examine the society within which I live. None of you do. Are not children our world's holy of holies? May we maintain the fortitude to pray towards Yerushalayim, towards the holy temple, towards the former location of the Kodesh HaKodashim, which was adorned with the faces of little kids. May we do it with a sense of purpose and obligation. May we purify the pathways that have allowed evil and violence to corrupt their worlds, rob them of innocence, and rob them of safety. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. I wish you all peace and strength in the coming days and weeks as we try to do a fix, a tikkun, for our area. I ask you all to please rise as we turn to page 155. Yikado! <laughs>